Pokemon Red and Blue are some of the most influential games to ever be released. The legacy of these games birthed a long franchise that would eventually become the highest grossing media franchise of all time. But looking back at the initial games, there's a lot to unfold. But today we'll specifically be looking at these games from a critical viewpoint to see how good or bad these first games were for the Pokemon series as a standalone experience. So, timestamps are on screen, and without further ado, let's talk about the original Game Boy's Golden Child. First up to discuss is the story narrative. As the first games in the series, this would define the mold that we see for most, if not all, of the games to follow. But in short, Professor Oak gives you a Pokedex, which is an encyclopedia of every Pokemon ever, and you are tasked with completing it. On a surface level, that's the basis of it. But the issue, of course, is the fact to beat the game, you don't even have to complete the Pokedex. So the goal set for you to complete from the very beginning of the game does not matter. So what is the actual primary goal of the player. Well, this is to beat all the Pokemon gems so you can in turn go challenge the Pokemon League and become the Pokemon League champion. So is there any other story piece to grab my attention while running around the land of Kanto? Well, kind of. So as you go throughout your adventure, you'll come across a criminal organization, in this case being Team Rocket. These guys are pretty realistic in what they do, such as the theft Pokemon and items in general, breaking and entering, and of course a takeover of a prominent business building. So, this is all grounded in reality. Even the members of the organization all dress the same, as if they're just sending a message to the people that live in Kanto. Are these guys not cool enough for you? Fun fact, they even have a secret base in the game corner, which is essentially a small casino. That's insane, dude! Regardless, they have a leader being Giovanni. This guy is the evil guy. There's not much to say in his goals other than world domination, which is a fair goal. No gimmicks attached. Surprise! He also happens to be the game's final gym leader. I'll talk on this later. And finally, our last story piece of note is the rival. He is your childhood friend, and also a bit of a prick, who is always looking to inflate his ego. Arrogant and talented, which works really well with the fact that your rival is just always one step ahead of you, of course, feeding into his cocky attitude. Overall, as a rival character, he works really well, since his attitude makes you want to completely beat his team into a pulp every single time you encounter him. Especially when he's just sitting in a Team Rocket infested Silphco, doing nothing to help the people inside, and of course once again at the Pokemon League as the game's final boss. But, everything said, the storytelling elements are not impressive here at all. From what is seen and said, is very minimal, but also not very intrusive, which I suppose this is a payoff since this is the style of storytelling that the first 9 Pokemon games to follow would adapt. But even then, Pokemon games would never be remembered for their story, but instead they'd be remembered for the gameplay loop that they make up the game with. Thankfully, for the lore addicts, there are are actually some books in the Pokemon Mansion that can give you a little bit of a backstory alongside the history of Mewtwo and Mew. But that's really all there is to explain story-wise. So, it's time we get to the part where we actually play the game. Up first is the main playthrough. So, most, and I mean most, mainline Pokemon games would follow the formula set in terms of which the game's progression is built. But in short, your end goal is to beat the Pokemon League, but to even go there, you are required to collect all eight gym badges of the region from their respective gym trainers. This stuff's elementary, we know how this all works by now, but since it's the first game, I kinda have to explain it, even ever so slightly. But with that aside, how does the playthrough itself perform? Well, it's a bit of a mess. The game from the start to Cerulean City is very linear, and then after Rock Tunnel, it opens up even further in terms of freedom granted to the player, but as I just mentioned, the progression is odd, so we'll cover these oddities in order that they occur. Starting immediately, we have the Pokemart thing right after you get your starter. This is a case of going to a random building that allows you to able to progress with zero hints to suggest that you needed to go here at all, likely as a tutorial to incentivize you to actually explore. The next two issues actually stem from one, and that comes from one of the game's biggest strengths, being its semi-non-linear gameplay. So to explain, in short, there's a few points in the game, for example, as soon as you reach Cerulean City, and after the Pokemon Tower stuff in Lavender Town, the game will begin to open up more, granting you more freedom in what you can do, as you get to do a few things, such as battling the fourth gym leader, going to Saffron City doing Silph Co. and the sixth gym, or crossing the region to reach Gym 5, and then follow up going to 
the Gym 7. But as I said earlier, the game is semi non-linear. Because sure, while you have the freedom to choose what's next to do and skip, at the end of the day, you have to get all 8 gym badges before you can beat the game. Hence, semi non-linear gameplay, also referred to as choosing one of many linear paths. Regardless, but another inconsistency that I need to speak on being the weird manner in which you enter Saffron City. Because in these games, if you want to get into Saffron City, you have to give a guard at any of the four gates a fresh water. Which is odd because this is just a random generic healing item that you can buy in bulk. Which of course means these are not key items. This is odd considering pretty much any item mandatory for game progression is a key item or an HM. So with this oddity out of the way and the progression coming back together after what you can call a collectathon being gyms 3 through 7, you'll end up fighting the last gym leader and the game is pretty linear from there. Overall, the game's progression is a little off and of course not so linear, which is one of the game's greatest strengths despite it hurting each game the semi non-linear gameplay would appear in, as the series would also be known for its sense of adventure and choosing one of several paths just feeds into it. So now that we're at the part where I discuss the Kanto region itself as well as its layout, but here's an issue, and that is the fact that the region is pretty well put together with minimal exceptions, so I will talk about those flawed areas in a second. But first, I want to praise the genius of this region's layout. Hey, so this is a long explanation, so if you just want to skip this part, go to the timestamp on screen, because this part isn't too important and retreads some old ground that I just mentioned, but here we have a region that is pretty well laid out that plays well into its semi-nonlinear gameplay, and doesn't get the praise it deserves. So again, if you don't care, then skip to the timestamp on screen. But now, let's begin. So to start the explanation, we'll break the game apart into four acts. Act 1 of Kanto's layout is simple, a straightaway to Mount Moon, with a single deviation to the Indigo Plateau and an optional rival battle, which is a foreshadow upon your return after you grab the 8th gym badge and need to progress to the Pokemon League. Act 2 starts coming out of Mount Moon right before entering Cerulean City. There's a ledge. This is the point of no return. From this point on, returning to Pewter City becomes impossible by walking unless you take an optional approach with Cut after trekking through Diglop's Cave to also randomly stumble upon the Flash HM, which also rewards explanation before your trip to Rock Tunnel. Going on, Act 2 of the region consists of Cerulean City, Vermilion City, Celadon City, Lavender Town, and Rock Tunnel, while you are also given the ability to just stumble into Saffron City early without the ability to do any of the story events in the area needed to beat the game, but you can still get rewarded with early access to something like the Psychic TM or a Gift Pokemon. With only access to Cerulean City and Vermilion City, the player has to cross through the pitch black hellscape we know as Rock Tunnel. With a journey potentially improved by exploring and getting the Flash TM, you will come out into Lavender Town and Celadon City before Act 3 of the region. Act 3 begins as soon as you finish the story event in the Lavender Tower, and now you can explore the rest of the region, being Cinnabar Island, Future City, and Saffron City. The semi non-linear gameplay kicks in here, as now you can either return to Saffron City and do the story events to be able to do the gym here, or you can go down either Route 17 or Route 12 to reach Fuchsia City. Again, there's some more semi non-linear gameplay here, as you can choose to go down Route 17 if you explored enough to get the bike, which is optimal for taking the fast route, or taking the slower route down Route 12, crawling with extra trainers to fluff out an ability to get more EXP. So okay, so congrats. You're in Future City, where you can now get the final HMs, mandatory for traversing the region, and the ability to reach some other optional locations. But the important newly accessible location being Cinnabar Island to get the 7th Gym Badge. Cool, so now we're on to Act 4. You return to Viridian City for the last Gym Badge, and congrats! Now you go to the Pokemon League, and then the game begins to end. 4 acts of gameplay, divided out by the region's rather interesting layout, and if you want to add a 5th act, there's also the post game being the Cerulean Cave post game that's just sitting in plain sight, staring you down for the entire game, but previously inaccessible. This has been a fun insight to Kanto's layout. Hopefully, like I did, you can at least appreciate this layout a little more. Moving on, I did mention some parts of the region's layout being atrocious. So, let's speak on those real quick. The Vermilion City Gym easily has one of the worst gym puzzles in the entire series. There's not even a real solution, it's just luck of all these trash cans, and you have to click two of them in order to move on to go fight the gym leader. It's pointless, it's dumb, no one likes it. The Indigo Plateau has a bunch of statues just randomly lined up after you exit Victory Road. It's just a pointless maze that gets in the way despite being incredibly easy to solve. And then there's Route 13. I swear, this route and its awful layout only exists to punish you for not getting a hold of the bike. But we're not done with the region navigation just yet. First off, as I just mentioned, is the bike. 
safe. This key item exists to make your movement faster, but sadly it's not allowed to be used indoors, and this is required to go down Route 17. This inclusion is pretty big, as there's no other way to speed up your overworld movement. And the last thing to mention in the segue is the HMs. Standing for hidden machines, these are attacks that can be taught to your Pokemon to help you explore in the overworld. This mechanic was intended to be a little bond with your Pokemon, to make some kind of connection that allowed them to manipulate the overworld, some kind of nonsense to that extent, but what it ended up being was an annoyance that involved the player going out of their way to temporarily use an Oddish with Cut to then box and never use again. That, and it also caused some extra constraints on your team building, as you can't fast travel if you don't have a Pokemon with Fly in your party. And one final thing to note is the gym badges. They actually have three mechanics built into them. So first off, you cannot use HMs in the overworld until you earn a specific badge that allows you to... For example, you cannot use Fly in the Overworld without beating the third gym, and Surf cannot be used after the beating the fifth. Some badges also give a minor stat boost to your Pokemon after obtaining specific badges, so look at the gameplay. Here of the first gym telling me about a boost. Finally, increasing the level cap in which traded Pokemon will actually listen to you, so actually doing the action you instruct it with, so of course two of those aren't even navigation related. But with all of that said and done, for gameplay progression, we can finally talk about the core gameplay itself. It should come to no surprise anyone that Generation 1, in terms of its core gameplay, has aged poorly. It's almost like being the first of something leads to it having dated or somewhat major inconsistency issues. So, beginning with the Pokemon themselves and basic traits, for the 151 Pokemon in the game, every single one of them has a unique set of stats, moveset, and the bonus stats that are able to be granted via EVs. And that's about it. These games had a very simple pool of features, but of course looking at the consistency with the future titles, one mechanic doesn't quite hold up, and and despite being recently explained in another video, surprise, it's time to talk about the EV system again. But in short, EVs are bonus numbers earned by battling, which will eventually accumulate to extra stats, which rewards you for battling as many Pokemon as possible, similar to leveling. But it's not quite the same, and these stats do have a cap as well. But the important thing to note here is that you can get a boost to all five of your Pokemon's stats permanently. But there's our transition, because look at that, five stats. So let's explain this real fast. In the first generation of Pokemon, and I mean, I mean, just the first generation, there are five stats for your Pokemon, not six. These being HP, Attack, Defense, Speed, and Special. Yeah, you heard that right, just Special. So what's the deal here? Well, in these games, the Special Attack stat and the Special Defense stat were one, so this would cause issues of a Pokemon using a special move and hitting the opponent's Special stat. Again, weird consistency issues that would be changed in Gold and Silver. That would make a big impact on Pokemon that did abuse these combined stats. Speaking of weird properties involving stats, next is the Speed stat, which for some reason is directly tied to critical hits, which in turn means faster Pokemon are significantly more likely to get a critical hit, where slower ones are not as likely. Next to talk about is the Pokemon types. So now I could explain how types work, but that's just a tedium that isn't really needed, as I can explain it as a more complicated version of Rock, Paper, Scissors. So instead, I wanted to point out the type charts and consistencies with the later games, since some of the changes either make sense logically or not. So let's just point out some of the odd type interactions that wouldn't last past Generation 1 itself. So up first is the Psychic type. For some reason, has an immunity to Ghost, which in gameplay you'll probably never notice, but logically it makes no sense, as the Psychic type's weaknesses are based on common human fears, and these games only bugs. Speaking of bugs, our next issue is its weird interactions with the Poison type, because for some reason they are both super effective against each other. Logically, Poison threatening bug makes sense since Pesticide exists, but bugs weakening Poison on the other hand, not so much. And the last interaction, being fire not actually resisting ice, which actually makes sense since ice melting just becomes water. Why was this changed? I literally couldn't tell you. There's some more stuff that is considered bugged or fun glitches, but we'll discuss those later. With that said, we can finally talk about the level curve and difficulty of these games. First up is the level curve, which, fun fact, is somehow worse than Diamond and Pearls, but the level curve itself especially struggles in the early game and in the late game, but also has the issue of you needing to frequently grind levels to keep up through the mid game, so it never ends since there's just not enough earned EXP to make level grinding a trivial task, which means it's on the forefront for the entire game's runtime. So while gym number one is packing a level 14 ace with no rock type attacks, it should be easy, right? Haha, <laughs> nice joke. The issue here is you don't get much EXP from the few trainers you do battle on your way up here, and if you chose Bulbasaur, the battle's free if you grind to level 13, because that's when you finally get a grab.
grass move. Squirtle can body this a battle at level 8, and of course Charmander can spam Ember and hope for burns. Why does this power imbalance exist? We'll never know. Regardless, the starters aside, the early game, a larger issue arises, being the terrible level up movesets, which comes into play since it makes using any Pokemon early game a dreadful experience of clicking tackle since they have nothing else to use, and getting levels on them is a tedious waste of time. Regardless, the end game also suffers from a lot. For example, the highest level Pokemon on a trainer's team in Victory Road is 48, but the issue here is that Champion's Ace is a level 65, which is a whole 17 level gap from where you'll probably be versus where you want to be. So surprise, you'll have to grind even more to stand a remote chance. I've said it plenty of times, but I'll say it again. An increase of grinding should never make up for difficulty. If that is the case, then you have failed the balancing. Also, crazy how I just said the difficulty word. Now, let's speak on that since the level curve is attempting to inflate this. Something actually hindering the difficulty is the movesets of the trainer Pokemon in the game, being, again, level up movesets since most Pokemon are stuck with these movesets, with very little trainer Pokemon who won't qualify in this regard to be stuck with exclusively level up learn sets. This means only the aces of each gym leader or elite four team will have a Pokemon that's not exclusively using level up learn sets. In this case, a single attack is switched out. So, for example, let's talk about the champion battle since this is an insult to the players. So if you chose Bulbasaur like I did for this gameplay, your rival's final team will have a Charizard at level 65. A ahem, wild Charizard would have Flamethrower, Fire Spin, Slash, and Rage. All they did here was change out Flamethrower for Fire Blast, which is less reliable, but they kept Rage, which is a terrible attack, and they're like, oh yeah, you don't need Flamethrower. Also, the Executor doesn't even have four moves. Do I need to explain that? But look at that Rhydon! Two of its attacks do the same thing! The issue is since the movesets are decided by level up, that means the final boss of the game is going to have access to pitiful attacks. I really don't need to explain why this is an issue when a moveset of the final boss has a full wasted move slot. There are other observations of this moveset issue across the game, such as every Abra only having teleport, or every Pidgey in the game having godforsaken sand attack if it's level 5 through 35. Regardless, these movesets become a huge issue for difficulty as it just leads to entire wasted move slots and barely any good attacks being distributed to the trainers that they belong to. But remember what I just said about the level curve being bad? Well, good, because that below average level curve is what saves this issue, since the Pokemon with horrific moveset will have better stats to remedy this large issue. Again, it doesn't fix the issue, but it lessens the blow. Other than the movesets and levels, there is nothing else to speak of in terms of difficulty. So since we just talked about movesets, now let's discuss the TM and HM mechanic. So TMs stand for technical machines and are one-time use move tutors. And similarly, the HMs I mentioned earlier function the same, but are unlimited use as they are needed to navigate the region. While TMs are a great mechanic to the game, only hindered by their limited use of nature, HMs on the other hand are much worse, as the attacks you can teach them cannot be removed from the Pokemon by any means. So you can't just temporarily teach a Pokemon Cutter Flash and then remove them later, since in battle, those two attacks in particular are not good at all. Because of this, as mentioned earlier, this will influence how you build your team so you can fast travel with Fly and waste a team slot just to use Cut instead of wasting a move slot on a Pokemon that you'll actually use. So, some final touches since I couldn't really find a place to mention these. But first, these games have a completely awful mechanic to catching Pokemon, and that is the fact in battle against certain Pokemon, your Pokeballs will just straight up miss. Yeah, it'll instantly fail. So not only is there a luck check for catching the Pokemon, but there's actually another one for deciding whether or not you just wasted a ball to begin with. And finally is the bag. While it seems fine at first, the issue is you can't pick up any items if the bag is filled. This is important because you could miss out on mandatory items needed to beat the game, or not being able to buy more healing items because you weren't prepared for an arbitrary limit capping off the amount of items you can carry. Regardless, that just about sums it up in terms of in-battle play. And since out-of-battle play has been discussed already, we'll just transition to end-game content and post-game in this section rather than a separate one due to the lack of content. So other than battling any trainers that you may have skipped during your main playthrough, the only other things you can do is complete the Pokedex, which most players will not bother with, or unlimitedly gamble at the game corner. Yes, slot machines are here, ladies and gentlemen. Gambling is completely legal here and unregulated. Jokes aside, the big mechanic of the series is also available, being trading, a feature used to get Pokemon not obtainable in your game with other players or a few NPCs in the game to gain access to Pokemon that are not found in the wild. And of course, on the trail of communication features, you can even battle with your friends. But moving on to the actual post-game content, you only gain access to Cerulean Cave, which is neat since some wild 
all Pokemon here have extremely high levels, even in the range of the 60s, but the highlight here is the legendary Pokemon being Mewtwo. That's it, the post game is just a cave with a bonus encounter. So, now with everything said and done, that's Pokemon Red and Blue, but there's something I mentioned earlier that's not yet been addressed. Ah yes, the glitches. You cannot talk about Generation 1 without mentioning glitches. There is a lot more glitches than the four I picked to speak about, or rather two glitches and two features that are a little overtuned and definitely needed to be mentioned. So up first in the glitch department is the missing no glitch. I'm going to be 100% honest here. This glitch right here is the only reason the gameplay isn't just a Venusaur solo run. So for the uneducated, this glitch allows you to encounter many glitched Pokemon, which can spawn over level 100, but this glitch glitch has one major bonus and one major issue that it can cause. The bonus is if you can encounter Missing No, your item in the sixth item slot of your bag will be duplicated to a number over 100, so rare candies and master balls for instance. But the issue is if you catch the damn thing, you can kiss your save file goodbye as well, as this will essentially kill your save file, so don't catch that glitched abomination. The next glitch to discuss is the Mew glitch. Fairly simple, it's just a glitch manipulating trainers to force a Mew to spawn in. Obviously this is only worth noting since Mew isn't obtainable through normal gameplay at all. So, the first of the overtuned features to be mentioned is attacks with increased critical hit rates. So remember when I talked about the speed mechanic and its increased crit rates earlier? Well, apparently, if a Pokemon with an attack like Razor Leaf or Slash with a speed stat roughly around 80 or higher, those attacks used from them will have a 100% critical hit rate. Urshifu fans are in shambles right now. Obviously, this is a big balancing problem because in the gameplay you're watching, there was never an instance besides quad resist attacks where I ever clicked tackle over Razor Leaf because it did more damage even to resisted targets. And finally, the bugged X accuracy. So this item doesn't actually increase accuracy by one with its use, but instead it outlandishly increases the hit rate with just one use, which leads to one hit KO moves, landing far more than they need to, which it feels like it's 100% accuracy, but I guess I just have bad luck. But regardless, with all of that out of the way, it's time to put Pokemon Red and Blue to a close. In short, Pokemon Red and Blue are a bit of a mess. Important to point this out, as every game in the series would go on and copy the formula down with very little deviation. With many different gameplay quirks that wouldn't be seen past Generation 1, the game offers a taste worth coming back for, even if the music is lacking in variety to make a noticeable chunk of it seem forgettable, paired with the atrociously hilarious sprite work that the Pokemon have to serve perfectly as the icing on the cake. My final score for Pokemon Red and Blue, believe it or not, which will come as a shock, is a 4 out of 10, a game with excellent, semi-addicting gameplay loop that's worth coming back for, whether for laughs or for a good time, while also pioneering innovation for the genre. 